Please take your Bibles and go to Proverbs chapter 19, if you would, please. Proverbs chapter 19. And if you did not receive a handout sheet, just lift your hand right up, and the ushers will see that you received one. And of course, uh, as you know, the last couple of chapters, I've said this, that, and the other, and this is more of this, that, and the other. And so uh, they are unique titles, to be sure. And of course, when you study the book of Proverbs, it's a book of a smorgasbord of many character traits and principles and precepts that God has given us as His people to help us maneuver through this life. And it touches on so many uh, various topics in the book of Proverbs. And one thing we have to make sure and do is that we really pass everything through the get, grid work, I say, of a Scripture. A lot of times what people do is they'll come up with an idea, they'll come up with a, what they perceive to be the right decision to make, and then they scour the Bible uh, trying to find a verse that will somehow give credence to what they want to do or to what their thinking process is. And Christians are not to operate that way. We're to take the Scripture and then we are to have everything filter through Scripture first. And so that will help us stay right. That's part of conforming to the Word of God and renewing our mind as Romans chapter 12 verse 2 talks about. And so when we study these particular chapters in the book of Proverbs, there's a variety of things mentioned. And it doesn't deal with any of these topics in detail. And so it requires some study as you sort of go through and uh, make a, a study of a particular topic using all 31 chapters. For example, you might want to take one month and if you are concerned about child rearing, then you would go through and you'd mark every verse that you're going through those 31 chapters and you would try to dig out all those principles that uh, are spoken of in regards to child rearing. If it comes to money, uh, you'll do the same thing. So just stop and think that if you were to take one chapter a day and you were to do a, a topical study, you could pretty much come up with really some powerful principles in which to live your life uh, based upon every single month taking one particular topic. So you could have 12 topics handled in the course of one year. And so it might be a fascinating study for you to uh, think of Sometimes when we go to the scriptures, we'll read them and we'll say, I wonder what God has for me today. And even if we think that far, sometimes we're just trying to get through a particular chapter and just say, I've read my chapter. And we don't go in with any purpose in mind. We're not going looking for anything. And if you are not looking for anything in particular, you probably won't find anything in particular. And so if you go in with a purpose, it's amazing how God will speak to you. And so I want to encourage you that way. And as we look at these various topics, we're going to stop from time to time as we have been and handle probably some subject matter more in detail than we do others. But let's start with uh, verse 1 here of our text passage of Scripture. The Bible here says, Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. And so, number one on your study sheet, it says, It is not a disgrace to be in poverty unless it is because of mismanagement. It is not a disgrace to be in poverty unless it is because of mismanagement. And I gave a couple examples here. And the first example I have is Job versus Ahab. Ahab, you know, was the king of Israel, and he had Jezebel as a wife. And he was a rich man, and yet he was never satisfied with his riches. In fact, uh, there's one particular account where he wanted somebody's vineyard. And so he pouts and cries and moans and groans and finally gets that. And so you have the man Job, who was a man of integrity, a man at one time of great wealth, but then he lost it all. A lot of times we would look at a man like that as probably if we were observing from a distance, we'd be like those miserable comforters. Uh, we'd say, you know, it's something. He was the richest man in the East. He's one, the Bible says, that fears God and eschews evil. He had all these herds and flocks and he had all these servants and lands. And then in the course of about a day, he loses it all. 
And then his children are taken from him, all ten of them, in one fell swoop. And you can imagine how the critics would have just been sitting on the fence post like vultures, just tearing him to pieces as far as his uh, relationship with God is concerned. And so you have a man like Job contrasted with Ahab, and yet God was pleased with a man like Job versus Ahab who uh, did wickedly with his life and with his riches. And so we have got to get a different view of what we uh, deem to be the, the uh, blessings of God upon our life. We think if we're uh, wealthy that somehow we're blessed. And we are to that extent if you're a Christian and right with God to be sure. But that is not really the identifier of your spiritual condition. Whether you have possessions or not, whether you have money or not, it all deals with your heart. And God does look at the heart. Amen? But we need to understand this principle here that it's not to be a disgrace uh, if you are in poverty and you don't have much. And so I list here also as an example Lazarus, and this would be in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to verse 31. And it talks about the rich man and Lazarus. And a lot of times we preach on that topic, uh, the topic of hell, from that passage. And the thing is, is it says that uh, Lazarus was a poor man, and he was a sickly man, he was a beggar. And so you would look at him in that day as being like the offscour and someone you would step over as you would conduct your business and go on your way. And yet God looked with favor upon Lazarus and disfavor about the man who fared sumptuously every single day. And so once again, we have a contrast. God being pleased with the one who's poor and in poverty versus the one that has great riches. And so if we're not careful as believers, we will equate, I would say, being right with God with having a lot, when that could be diametrically untrue with the opposite view in mind of the poverty that some carry in life. If you take your Bibles, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is a passage of Scripture that we usually use for faith promise, and it's a great chapter for the illustration of faith promise. But I want you to see where even in Paul's day, in the early church, there were those who had great riches. Barnabas would be a man that had some wealth about him as we looked at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we see that he gave uh, the proceeds of some money uh, to the church and distribution was made to the saints that were in need. And so he was a man of the son of consolation. He had a, a big heart towards people as we see in the scriptures. He's the one that took Paul under wing and introduced him to the church. And also we see him after the, John Mark had withdrawn from the first missionary journey. Later on we see him taking John Mark and working with him to where he becomes profitable uh, for the ministry later on in his life. But we see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Let's look at verses 1 and 2. It says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So even though these Christians in Macedonia were poor, and desperately so, they had a heart to give, and they give, they gave out of their, their poverty. Uh, they came up with an offering in honor of the Lord Jesus Christ and to help other believers who were in need. And they were used as an example and as a glorious example. And I don't think now, as we look back 2,000 years later, I don't think those Christians who are in heaven right now are sad that in the midst of this life, they may have been classified as poor, not having a whole lot, and yet at the same time, they gave out of that deep poverty, and they're enjoying the blessings of God today. Amen? And so we see here, they were uh, poor individuals. Let's go to 1 Peter, if you would. 1 Peter. I'm just showing us here something, because we, there's a, that movement, the faith movement, 
that uh, tries to say that if you are poor, that somehow, some way, you are not right with God. And uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Some of God's choicest servants found in the scriptures were right with God and they were blessed by God. And we have to be careful here because in our materialistic society, we have the tendency to think, well, I've got to keep up with everyone else. And if somehow someone's getting more than I've got, that somehow I must be a little bit less in God's eyes. I must not be as important as so-and-so is because look how God's blessing them materially and I seem to be left out. And uh, we've got to get that out of our heads. <laughs> the key to the Christian life, of course, is Christ and our relationship with Him. Whether we're rich or whether we're poor or whether we're middle class, wherever, it's our relationship with Christ that matters. Let's look here in uh, chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Let's begin reading in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible. It's interesting to me that before he gets into some of these other details of the Christian life, Peter just gets our focus right on heaven. And you know, that's what we need to do. We need to understand that this is not what it's all about right here. Uh, you know, living this life is not about the car you drive, the truck you drive. It's not about the lands you own and the house you live in and the holidays you can take. It's all about laying up treasure in heaven. Matthew chapter 6. It says here, to an inheritance incorruptible. You know what? You buy a truck and after a while, it's going to start wearing out. Rust is going to start showing unless it's plastic. Then it's just going to crack on you. But at the same time, to an inheritance incorruptible. It's not going to fade away. Undefiled and that fadeth not away. Reserved in heaven for you. And it's incorruptible. It won't fade away. It won't get old. It won't be like wings and fly away. It says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now, look at this verse here, now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That's a multiplicity of tests and trials and temptations to be sure as the scripture uh, mentions here. And they seem to be a burden and heavy upon you. And it says here, it, it's this season, it's this time of life. And it says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Let's flip over now to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we'll go on from this passage here, but I just really felt like we need to just have a little bit of a reset. Everybody's so concerned now about their retirement benefits and the runaway inflation. And I understand the concern that we have and the gas prices and you know, living by a budget and how that, that thing's just being <laughs> blown to smithereens, so to speak, in regards to the way uh, the pricing is going out of uh, sorts for so, in so many areas. At the same time, I think we need, this could be a good time to readjust our thinking and our philosophy in regards to the blessings of God upon the believer. And it says here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, I want to begin reading in verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, that's healthful words, that's scriptural words to be sure. It says, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such 
withdraw thyself. So when you turn on the boob tube and you're listening to these guys tell you that you need to send them $100 so that you could get $1,000 and you can send them $1,000 and reap $10,000, you need to withdraw yourself. In other words, you need to turn the channel. You don't need to give it. You say, but they teach so good on other matters. Don't subject yourself to the deceitfulness of riches and preaching like that. And so it says here in verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Now you stop and think about the money problems that you worry about, the things that you are concerned about, and so on in regards to your needs or your wants, and it, you could use this as a standard. And it says here, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So if you have to drive an old car, drive an old car. Uh, if you can do something better than that, there's no problem with that. But don't bemoan yourself. Don't fret against God. Don't uh, uh, belittle yourself in the eyes of God and yourself in regards to, you know, not having what everybody else may have. It says here, but they that will be rich, doesn't mean they're rich, but will be rich. They seek to be rich. They can be poor, but yet because they're eaten up with wanting to be rich, then it says here, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. If God chooses to bless you materially, praise his name. But at the same time, if he chooses not to, don't curse his name. In other words, when I'm saying about cursing his name, I'm not talking about using foul language. I'm talking about where you get upset at God for not blessing you as you perceive that you're worthy and to be blessed. Because the fact of the matter is, we're not worthy. Uh, we are unworthy. And anything we have is bonus. And may we just be reminded that some of God's choicest servants, yes, materially, did not have much. And some of them, even taking the proper stand and being right with God, they paid the ultimate price uh, for their faith. I was talking to someone recently, and I, we mentioned about the various ones who, you know, walk with God and, and live for God, and they were right with God. You think of John the Baptist. There's not been a greater prophet, the Lord Jesus himself said, than John the Baptist. He takes a right stand, gets thrown into jail, and then ultimately is killed. Uh, he was right with God. Sometimes we would sit on the sidelines and say, well, he should have been more diplomatic than that. He should have maybe called for a meeting of the you know, judges and so on and tried to impress them in some way. But you know, he was leather lunged and he was dressed in camel's hair and ate locusts and wild honey. And boy, he was just uh, crying aloud as a, as a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe he could have handled things differently. No, he was right with God. He was a forerunner to be sure. And yet, because of his proper stand, uh, his life was cut short. And so, once again, was, he, was, was that bad? No, it was good. And we think of the disciples, the apostles. Every single one of them, save one, died a martyr's death. And even John, the beloved who wrote the book of Revelation, it says that he lived about, uh, I think, somewhere around 100 years of age, and uh, he was one who had a natural death, but my, he paid a price physically in this life by being dipped in a vat of hot oil and then exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And so these men did not have it easy. Some of our uh, brethren that uh, helped us to this point, bringing us the gospel down through the centuries. I've got the Fox's Book of Martyrs. I also have a big book, it's about that thick, called The Martyr's Mirror. And it goes from the first generation, first century, all the way to the 17th century only. 
and it lists page after page after page of those individuals, men, women, boys, and girls, that because of their stand for the faith, they gave their very lives for the cause of Christ. And we need to be reminded that our faith may cost us something, but that's not a bad thing. And it doesn't mean that we're not right with God because we go through times of persecution. We could be very right with God and yet have even critics amongst our brethren and our sisters, but at the same time being very right with God. And we need to be reminded of that as we look at the scriptures. And here once again, we, we see this as we study the book of Proverbs, how that there's time and time again where money is brought into the equation and yes, we're being taught in many of these verses the proper use, the proper application, but also we need to think right in our context as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is not a disgrace to be in poverty unless it is because of mismanagement. And of course, you have the examples there of Job and Lazarus. Number two on your study sheet says we should calculate wisdom by God's standard. He judges by character, not possession. Okay, let's, uh, 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 you see here, I've, I've given in my notes, excuse me, in my notes I give an example of Abraham and Lot. Both of them had great riches. They had riches. But by the same token, one was right with God being a rich man, and one was wrong with God being a rich man. Both of them, as far as the New Testament indicates to us uh, are saved men as we would count being saved today. And so we would say, because in Peter it talks about that righteous man, talks about Lot being a righteous man, and then we see Abraham, but yet they had to separate. One had a proper view of the things of this world, and then the other had an improper view of the things of this world. And when God puts his stamp of approval on someone, He's looking more at the character of that individual and not what they possess. So once again, possessions is not the key measure of your spirituality and you being right with God or not right with God. Character means this, it means to engrave. In other words, I say this, uh, predictability, I guess you could say, really defines character. You know when, when someone will act and react once you get to know them. In other words, a person of uh, honest character will always primarily act honestly. In other words, when you say someone is honest, what you're essentially saying is it doesn't matter what circumstance that individual is found, he will be honest. And so you say he's got an honest character. In other words, honesty is engraved in him. He's got an honest character. It's part of who he is. And you see, that's what God looks at. Uh, can he trust you with riches? Can he trust you with possessions? Can he trust you with a sacred trust? Can he trust you to carry out his demands, his commands in the scripture as he's given them to us? I say this, a person with good moral character will act in good moral behaviors. In other words, it doesn't matter what situation they find themselves, they are going to act in the utmost care of their morals. They're gonna be godly in their morals, and so on. And so that's what we ought to be striving for to really build our character and to establish our character. And uh, it's so critical for us to understand that. I'm gonna back up just a little bit. And uh, this is something, I don't know, you do have some space on the back of your study sheet. I just want to uh, give you a little bit of something in regards to uh, a money issue, especially in these days. And it's not anything deep, but it's something I, I just wanna give you tonight uh, as we, we talk about this particular uh, subject. And that is number one, when you think about uh, money, let me encourage you to establish a budget. Uh, establish a budget. And I know I'm probably getting a lot of groans on the inside when people say, oh yeah, the budgets just don't work for me, and so on and so forth. But you know, it's amazing how uh, if you operate 
on a budget, you can track your expenses, your income, and so on, and you'll find uh, where you may have leaks in your, your lifestyle, you may have leaks uh, in your business, so on and so forth. Many businesses will have a budget. Our church has a budget. And it's a good thing that we have a budget because we're able to track our expenses and with a ministry this size and with so many hands, so to speak, in the pie, it's real easy if you're not careful to just spend, 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 and before you know it, you can have folks spending money all over the place and you're really not tracking it properly. And sometimes you need to be able to put a break on something for a while and a budget will allow you to do that. I encourage people, especially in my class, you've heard this, where uh, you, you try to take a three by five card or maybe your phone and every expense that you make for the next two weeks, write that thing down, put it in your computer, whatever you do, however you track it. If you whip into Tim Hortons, put that in there. If you work at a job site and they tell you to put a quarter in there or, or you know, a loony or whatever it is in the coffee cup, uh, so you, and you drink the coffee and have the refreshments and whatnot. Keep track of that when you drop into the store and that kind of stuff. And you, you'd, you'd be surprised how much money you spend in the course of a month or in the course of two weeks, I should say. And you just track that and then you can determine how you need to maybe uh, shore that particular area up. Think about uh, just one cup of coffee at Tim Hortons. $2.05. You do that for, let's say you do it five days a week. You know, there's 20 work days in a month, primarily, if you work five days a week. And so you think of one cup of coffee, you know, you're up over $40 just right there. And so it wouldn't take much. $40 times 12 is what? $480 in a year. You start doing that in all those other areas, and you can have a lot of money going out, right? And so you and I need to be very, very careful on the way we spend our money, and a budget will help you uh, to stay on track with that. And get some counsel. And you know, the way you spend money, I'm, when I say this, I'm not asking you and encouraging you to live by somebody else's budget or somebody else's mindset of the way you, they think you ought to spend your money. Because every one of us, if we look critically at it, someone else, can think of ways that they ought to be saving money. You know, And so that's not the issue. You have to answer to God, uh, just like they have to answer to God. And so I'm just encouraging you, in this time especially, if you find money being tight and so on, get yourself a budget and then uh, go get with somebody and they can maybe look the budget over and help you with that. Uh, Anna Taves is good at that. I think we have a CPA now in our congregation. Uh, Kevin uh, Rimple could help you with that. Brother Helms taught it in college and so on. Uh, Anna has. There, there are people uh, that could help you if you needed some help establishing a budget. And if you and your spouse cannot really agree on certain things, that's where getting counsel might be advantageous for you. But you'd be surprised if you would just practice that one little aspect of money management, how that you could probably end up with a lot more money than what you think of in, in uh, your, your uh, life. So get counsel, and I say this, get educated. In other words, to apply wisdom, you need knowledge. You know, and the Bible, of course, talks about that in the scriptures. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Chapter 9, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you have knowledge, and then you get the knowledge, and then you say, well, now how do I practice this? Have you ever heard somebody preach or teach on any topic at all? And then you say, well, okay, I see what the Scripture says, but how do I apply this now? How do I put it in everyday shoe leather? And that's really where a lot of our difficulty lies today is uh, we're not applying the truth that we know. Because in many quarters, we're not devoid of the truth and knowing the truth. It's that practicing, that living out of that truth. And so when you think about this, this area of money, 
You need to get yourself educated in regards uh, to that and then uh, apply. Study first and foremost what the Bible has to say about money. Uh, because there are a lot of various teachings about money. And you know what? A lot of them use scripture. <laughs> and so you need to make sure that they're rightly dividing the word of truth. And you won't know that unless you get in there and study the scriptures too. And I say this, be obedient. So you get counsel, you get educated, you be obedient. And that means the first and foremost, you tithe. And you don't give God the leftovers, you give him first. It's first fruits. I'm glad he's the first fruits of them that slept. What that means, of, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, is he's risen from the dead. And because he's alive, we will live. Amen. He's the first fruits. And so it's, it's commanded in Scripture to give a tithe. And uh, some people are out there and they'll try to discount that. I, I've said it here before that there was a prosperity preacher that talked about, well, you know, God understands if you can't really tithe. Uh, you start with uh, a couple of percent and you can work up from there. Folks, tithe means, look it up in the dictionary, it means 10. Okay? In other words, the fact of the matter is, you and I have nothing. Deuteronomy chapter 8 says, Who is it that gives you the strength to get up in the morning? Who is it that gives you the strength to earn money? Uh, it's God that does that. He could take it all away from you <laughs> if you're not careful. Uh, but at the same time, he gives you that. And so he says, okay, I'm going to give you $100. So he gives you $100 and he says, now I want you to give me 10 of that back. That's a pretty good deal by anybody's standard. I have nothing. Somebody gives me $100 and then asks for $10 back. You see, that's a heart check. That's what that is. That's a heart check, isn't it? And so he gives us that 100 uh, and then we give him 10 back and then we get the privilege of living off $90. It's a pretty good deal. And it's across the board. So if you make $100 and he asks for 10, I mean, it's the same principle if all of a sudden the guy next to you gets $1,000, he has to give $100 up. And so it's across the board. And, uh, and you say, well, that's Old Testament law. May I remind you that Abraham gave tithes of all and Abraham was before the law. And then Moses came, was given the law, and tithing was a part of the law, right? And so then we find even Jesus in Matthew chapter 23, he lists there, he says, hey, you tithe of men and anis and coming, and uh, you uh, just leave out the weightier matters of the law. He says, these things ought ye to have done, but not left the other undone. In other words, he advocated tithing. Then you go on into the Pauline epistles and you see where the church gave. First uh, Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1, the people gave to the church there their tithes and their offerings. Malachi chapter 3, even God mentions as he closes out the Old Testament scriptures about the principle of tithing and how that people have actually robbed God. How have they robbed God? Through their tithes and offerings. And he says, put me to the test. Uh, you put God to the test and see if he won't bless you. But what we think, though, when we think about blessings, once again, in the area, if he's asking us for money, he says, well, then he's going to give me money. He may not. He may bless you in some other means. That's his prerogative. And so we just need to be obedient. And so make sure that when you're putting a budget together, that you're putting God first in that budget. And then, of course, I say, uh, seek him. Seek him. In other words, his preeminence. In all you're seeking, seek him. Make sure uh, that you keep your focus, as the choir uh, sang Sunday morning, about him being our focus. He used to be our focus. We ought to be do, doing everything so that he might have Colossians chapter 1, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And sometimes, we can show the preeminence of Christ in our poverty. We can show the preeminence of Christ in our sickness. We can show the preeminence of Christ in our blessings. We can show the preeminence of Christ in our wealth. So there are a variety of ways that we can go through life and in every area, whether we're rich or poor, it ought to be to show him preeminent, amen? And so we seek him. 
And so uh, let's go on now in our study sheet. Uh, number three, but let me just say once again, uh, try me on the budget thing. Try me on that. And then number three, a man determines to go his own way, do his own thing. Then when it is time to harvest the fruit of his actions, he frets for the sorrow. This is taken from Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 3. The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. And you know, it's interesting about that word uh, fret. It means to be peeved. It means to be angry. It means to be, in some respects, sad, but sad towards God. Now that's interesting. Notice what it says here again, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. You see, what happens many times, if we're not careful, we will have what we would say are bad things happening to us, and rather than uh, looking at them as opportunities to show his grace and to show faith in his grace and in his person, what we do is we begin to blame God. Why is God doing this to me? Why is he allowing this to take place in my life? This is not fair. I'm a better person than so-and-so, and yet look what he gets, and look what God's doing to me. And we begin to fret and get angry at God. And we have to be careful of that, amen? And we have to watch out for that because as the sparks fly upward, man is born to adversity. The fact of the matter is, if the Lord tarries his coming, none of us will get out of this world alive. Every single one of us will die. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. The fact of the matter is, uh, before I was uh, conceived and before I uh, was born, you know, I, I didn't know when my birthday would be. And just as I don't know what my, when my birthday was, <laughs> people had to tell me. I'm just taking everybody's word for it at this stage, you know. Uh, and <laughs> a little joke came to my mind, but I'm going to let that go right on through. But, uh, but, you know, the same thing, I don't know when I'm going to die. He may give me many years. He may give me just a couple of hours. He may just give me a minute. I don't know. But it's a point that a man wants to die. And so what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say we ought to not fret against the Lord. We ought to be showing him evident in every area of our life. And where it says here, man determines to go his own way, do his own thing. Then when it is time to harvest the fruit of his actions, he frets for the sorrow. In other words, many times as you would hear maybe your parents say or somebody else, you made your own bed, now sleep in it. Have you ever had somebody say that to you? You made your bed, now sleep in it. What they're saying is, hey, you did what you did, now you have to live through the consequences of what you did. And so you can't blame God. You have to assume the blame and the consequences yourself. And so man determines to go his own way. We're responsible for the decisions we make. And even when others close to us make the wrong decision, then it's up to us to have the right reaction. And so that's where our relationship with God and staying close to him is so vital, so important. No, you can't control what the others do around you, but you can control what happens in you and how you react to that outward stimuli. And so it's so important for us to understand that principle as we live life. It's never right to do wrong to get a chance to do right, amen. And so we see how important uh, this is. Now look at number four, and then we're gonna have to draw things to a close. It's not a, really a, the, the optimum part, because uh, uh, I, I, I have more to say about this later, but we'll cover this number four. A wife is either a helpmeet or a hindrance in the service of the Lord. In Proverbs uh, chapter 19, verses 13 and 14, it says, A foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. Now, once again, 
I'm not going to do what Jake did and just blame all the ladies here. Uh, at the same time, we need to be reminded of, you know, the Bible gets a lot of flack from the disobedient, the unsaved, and the carnal Christian. And uh, the reason they say is because of how uh, patriarchal uh, the scriptures are. When you look at the book of Proverbs, it's a dad talking to a son. So naturally, you're going to have a lot of the emphasis of principles and commands given from that particular point of view. But you could also take these same principles and apply it to the female, not the 52 genders out there, but to the males and the females. That's who's being addressed in the scriptures. And by the way, that's who God addresses, and that's who God makes, males and females. Okay? And so, how do we know that? Because the scriptures. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I digress. Okay? And so that's why he's writing the way he writes. And so he addresses this to his son and uh, says, A foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are continual dropping. And so you see, Solomon was well versed to be able to address this topic, having 700 wives and 300 concubines. He was disobedient in the way that he lived his life in regard to his relationships. And that's evident because the scriptures even say that those women turned away his heart from the Lord. And so it's so important for us to look at the scriptures properly, as well as you see the importance of the marriage union, to be on the same page, to be working and walking in the same direction, and to be in agreement. And that means a, a variety of things in regards to submission is concerned. Submission to God and submission to uh, the spouse. And so here we see in your study sheet, a wife is either a helpmeet or a hindrance in the service of the Lord. We ought to find our completeness in the successes of our mates. And that's, that's both. In other words, I ought to be pleased when I see Brenda prospering in her way and being blessed of the Lord and used of the Lord, and she ought to find her fulfillment in me as well. There's that mutual uh, admiration, I guess you could say, that mutual uh, togetherness that we have as the two become one flesh and we're working together. I trust as we're united together, we're more effective for the cause of Christ. And what we also need to see is the examples of how powerful it is to marry right. And it's so important to marry properly. You have a Jezebel and Ahab. You study the life of Ahab and Jezebel, and you find that rather than helping one another do right, they help one another do wrong. And both of them were wicked before God. Both of them suffered before God. And yet, then you have in the New Testament, you have an Aquila and Priscilla, who were really uh, just servants of the Apostle Paul, and we find them starting a church in their house. Then they uproot their business as tent makers, and they travel to this other place, and they, what, they are ministering with Paul and helping to establish a church there. I mean, they, they were just, uh, what a team they were for the cause of Christ. Boy, in Acts chapter 18, they hear this man, Apollos, preaching, and they say, man, you know, he's preaching that the Messiah is yet to come, and yet Jesus has come. He is the Messiah. This guy's mighty in the scriptures. Man, can he preach. And so this husband and wife team take this man aside, and praise the Lord, he was humble enough to listen to a man and a woman. And guys, you do well sometimes to listen to a woman. I'll just go on from there. Maybe, maybe Brenda can help me out with that later. She'll pat me on the back. Good boy, good boy. You know, but at the same time, uh, you know, hey, she, they pull him aside. And they, what does it, it says? They explain the word of God more perfectly to him. In other words, you know, she knew the scriptures too. And she ha helped give understanding to that man, Apollos. Here was a learned man. He was from the city of Alexandria. That was known for the big library of the day, the educational center of the day. And yet, he submitted himself, and this husband and wife team taught him the word of God. And what did he do? 
He embraced Christ, understood who Christ was, preached Christ, souls got saved, and that was because of a husband and wife working together. You and your wife, you and your husband can be a powerful team for the cause of Christ. Amen? And that's what God wants. You ought to be more effective in helping the cause of Christ because you're married. <laughs> you know, not fighting one another, not arguing one another, not being a poor testimony. You ought to be what? You ought to be a shining example as a husband and wife of the relationship that Christ has with the church, that Christ has with the believer, because that's the picture of the marriage union. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. We'll stop right there and Lord willing, pick up next time. We'll get into some other topics like child rearing and whatnot. All righty. As the musicians play, if you need to come, why don't you come right now? Maybe there's a decision you need to make. Maybe it's in regards to your view of wealth. Maybe you've had a skewed view of what it means to experience the blessings of God.